Yeah, this one's going to have a bit of a flavour, a different flavour to the other presentations because it's the results of geophysical surveys, so there aren't any dates to them. But we do have some knowledge of uh, the sites and some have already been excavated. But I'm here to present the results of uh, resistivity of magnetometry surveys across four late Neolithic, early Bronze Age Henge monuments in the Millfield Basin in Northumberland. Very brief introduction to Henges. There are uh, earthworks uh, which consist of a circular ditched enclosure. An outer bank is sometimes there, but some don't have them at all. One or two entrances, but sometimes, uh, which is through the ditch so that you can enter the centre of the enclosure, but sometimes they can be segmented, which I'll talk about shortly. They are dated usually to the late Neolithic and they, they start to appear across the British Isles around 3500 BC. And they continue into the early Bronze Age across that transition there, and they go out of they early go out of use around 1700 ish BC. Um, it's often said that um, the Bronze Age aspect of the uh, Henges is reused due to uh, them being satellite burials surrounding the original monument. And it is often, they are uh, thought to be prehistoric temples, but there are many, uh, many different uh, thoughts out there. And with it, with, you not, with us not being able to have a very specific reason for the uses behind this, it is a bit of a breeding ground for pseudoscience and things like that. But I think prehistoric uh, temples uh, is probably one of the best uh, uh, theories that we have up to yet. And there's an image of the reconstruction of Millfield North, which you can visit near the Red Lion pub in Millfield in North Cumberland. Uh, this one had a timber circle in it. You can see a ditch and a bank in the background. And if I had a wide, wide angle lens, I probably would have caught it all. <laughs> but here we have the uh, where they are placed across uh, across England. Uh, we have um, the hedges are in blue, the timber circles are in purple, and stone circles are in red. And as you can see from this map, this topographical map, they're almost uh, hedges and tim timber circles are almost exclusively built in lowland river valleys whereas snow circles tend to be in upland and mountainous regions of the island. And this is a heat map showing the density of Henry across England. It would look a lot different if I included Wales and Scotland in there, because they have uh, quite a number of Henry's themselves. But as we can see, we've got quite a, quite a dense distribution here of Henry's down in the uh, Salisbury Plain area of the Stonehenge landscape. But where we'll be looking is here. This is the Millfield Basin, and it has the highest concentration of um, Henry's. In, a, in that area in England. And as you can see there from the topographical map, it's the perfect place for the site of the hedge in between the, uh, the rivers Till and Glen. Uh, it used to be a lake in the Mesolithic which burst its banks this way. And one of the, one of the good things about that is that it's got a sand gravel base, uh, which was the bottom of the lake back in the Mesolithic. And this is really good for uh, clear images when it comes to the geophysical process. Um, and uh, the water flooded out this way, bringing some of that sand gravel down towards Wooler, which we'll talk about in a second, as Wooler has a small hinge on it that we did study as part of this project. So here we have where the, uh, where the hinge monuments are um, between the rivers Till and Glen. Uh, there's actually one first lint off, is off the map there up to north, and that was excavated um, during the time of these uh, geophysical surveys. We have Millfield North, Whitton Hill, which is the Bronze Age burial site. Millfield South, Coupland and Marlin, which are all joined by an avenue that comes in at the west of Millfield South, goes through the centre of Coupland and terminates to the west of Marlin. Then we have Ewer and Ekeld down this way, and Yevering, which sits in the valley, which these are the, these are the Chimbias here, so this is the mountain range. And then we have an upland area to the east here as well, which is absolutely covered in uh, cup and ring rock art. So, um, we also have another one, which is the only one study which is outside of the Millfield Basin, which is Waller, which would be about here. So here are the hinges that were, well these are from, uh, taken from crop marks and these are scaled. So uh, these are the hinges that were surveyed as part of this project. We've got Coupland, which is the largest, which is roughly 65 metres. Um, we have eight out steads, which from the crop mark you can see a line of posts or pits which uh, is, uh, go within the enclosure and follow the line of the ditch. We have Marlin over here, which is uh, where it says usually you've got one or two entrances. This one has at least nine segments of the ditch. And then we have Woolock, which is the smallest and most recently discovered. 
So all of the uh, the Henrys were discovered through uh, aerial photography and with that uh, sand gravel uh, natural geology, you can see that they show up really well. So this is Coop, one of the largest of the uh, of the Henrys in the Millfield Basin. And next to it is the results from the magnetometry survey there, which is uh, obviously we've got the ditch, you can see that clearly in both the crop map, and we've also got the avenue with the two lines coming down here as well. That's continuing from Millfield South and continues on down to Marlow. One of the strangest aspects that we found is this, and uh, we were unsure of what that was. Um, there was a lot of questions thrown around. Somebody suggested it was a chain that was buried because it's a very strong magnetic response. And the magnetometer uses electromagnetic uh, frequencies to pick these up. Uh, eventually, we found out that this, the most likely explanation to this is lightning induced magnetic phenomenon. And it's where light, um, a very powerful bolt of lightning has hit the ground, uh, it's penetrated the surface, and it's magnetized the microscopic iron particles within the soil. Um, the reason we know this is geophysical, uh, geophysicists in Ohio, in America actually surveyed a field and then waited for lightning to sit and then resurveyed it so we know what that candle looks like and it's an incredibly uh, incredibly clear uh, image of that. Um, there's not much else really to say about it because as you can see the image pretty much what can be seen from the aerial photograph but there are a number of anomalies, pit features, possible pulse holes within the centre and the northern entrance where it was excavated in the 90s by Clyde Waddington where they found patches of burning, pulse holes things like that, but no, uh, no evidence of uh, any kind of satellite burials, and that was one of the aims, I shouldn't have mentioned that before, sorry, that was one of the aims of us doing these surveys, was to try and find, uh, survey the larger landscape and try and see if there are any of these later burials associated with these monuments. The resistivity tells a bit of a different story, because um, we did, uh, this, the other aim and objective was to see if we could find any um, uh, any different aspects to the architecture of these monuments. And as you can see, very faintly, but they're all the same, there's a secondary ditch that goes around the, uh, around the uh, interior ditch there. It's not a strong response, so more than likely not cut to this deeper level. But it's something that hasn't been, uh, hasn't been seen on this hinge before. And unfortunately, there's no, no sign of anything else around it, really, that's uh, worth mentioning. And there we have, there's the... Uh, all the anomalies put together from the map and resin overlaid on top of each other. And um, yeah, that's uh, the main thing from that survey that we found was that it seems to have a secondary ditch. And that would have to be excavated to see uh, the order in which that went down. We know that the avenue is later than the ditch because they haven't really planned it too well when they dug the avenue and they've made a break here so because they went out of line and had to continue down this way. So the avenue is later than the monument itself, but we're not too sure about when the uh, secondary ditch was in the excavation. Should be able to give us some uh, datable evidence from that, hopefully. So the next one we surveyed was uh, Marlino, and this is from the top of the hill fort at Yettering Bell. And we can see that Coopland is just here, and only a few fields over is East Marlin over there. As you can see from both of these, there's nothing uh, on all these sites, there's nothing visible on the ground surface, the are just fields. Uh, slight undulations, but no evidence of uh, what previously stood there. And this is Marlin over here, so we can see the avenue coming down and terminating somewhere around here. Uh, not to be mistaken for these ones, which are thought to be ice wedge casts, which were created with the uh, geological formation of the landscape. But we do have the uh, magnetometry results next to it, and obviously we've got an underground utility running through there, which uh, we see it's an electrical cable. But what we do have here is we have the ditch going round. We also have a number of satellites all around the edge, one just creeping over the other side of the, uh, the cable there. Now it also looks like two of these terminate at the end of the avenue. Um, very early, very early uh, references to this site. So there was an upstanding earthwork at one time in the centre of it. In the centre there, we've got a circle, and it's more than likely that that is another burial. And here we have the resistivity. And the good thing about the resistivity is, for the first time, we can actually see a bank going around the ditch, which is this uh, this lighter area here. And it also has breaks in it which correspond with the anomalies seen in the magma satellite. So it does look like there has been something dug into parts of the bank as we go around. And here we've got just about to see the avenue coming in and a large um, negative feature there. 
And then we go on to Akeld Steads. Akeld Steads is, as we can see, a really good crop mark because we can see these uh, timber bulls running around in the centre of the ditch. Uh, ditch all quite as well. Here we've got the ditch coming around. With it. We can't see much more because we have this modern field boundary running through it. But we do have quite quite a large kind of mass of, um, of circles kind of going on there. You can't see as much on that, but these do look like ring ditch burials, which this uh, which the uh, this machine and myself have found very similar, and we've dug them, and they are found to be ring ditch burials on the Isle of Anglesey. And here we have the uh, res. One of the interesting aspects about the Calcedes is it does seem that the, the Henge ditch was completed at some point, and it's often believed that this was a decommissioning ceremony on these monuments. And it would be interesting to get uh, to see if we could find a date for when this actually ended its life, be it in the Neolithic and then was reused in the Bronze Age, or was it actually continuously uh, in use into the Bronze Age and then decommissioned later. Oh. It was during uh, the resistivity survey that as I was packing the machine up, I saw a piece of flint sticking out of the freshly ploughed uh, field. And it actually turned out to be a transverse arrow of the late Neolithic. We often find these um, in Henge monuments. One was found in, uh, within the Henge of Brinketh within Arlen Anglesey, and there are other cases of it. It's quite a strange shape to it because it doesn't go to a point. But um, these are found uh, thought to be uh, late Neolithic in date. And then we've got the smallest and most recently discovered is Walter, but it was hiding in plain sight all along on the Cricket Club website. You can see it just here. Uh, <laughs> someone, someone conveniently stood there to scale as well. But here's a much clearer image that showed up on a very dry day on Buller Cricket Club. And um, the survey brought, uh, which we can just about make out the ditch of this, well, this one's, uh, I think this one's about 16 metres in diameter, so it is the smallest. And some, uh, there are some people who do break down the categories of hedges, but I was calling more hedge monuments for ease. Uh, we've got the, uh, the ditch uh, running around there. We have another circular feature at the top and another feature here. These two scrabble anomalies uh, line up perfectly with the crease of the cricket club, so we suspect that they're to do with when it was turned into a cricket field. And this, uh, the res, so it's, we've clearly got the, uh, the ditch circuit there. But the interesting thing is this, uh, this uh, is that the underlying geology is seen. And as uh, uh, water is known as the gateway to the Cheviots, so when the, when the Mesolithic lake broke its banks, it poured down into the Cheviots and it dragged a spit of this uh, sand gravel down into it on which this, this monument was built. So it does seem that the underlying geology does have uh, some kind of significance when it comes to understanding <coughs> why they were built where they were. And during the surveys, um, this uh, Henry at first went off was being excavated at the same time. We can see it just popping out here, and this one was, uh, was dug the following year. And you can see the, uh, the, the dark mud of the ditch picking up really nicely on that orange sand gravel. Within the centre of the hedge was found a fragment of the polished stone axe, I believe it's Langdale. Um, a blade of bloodstone from the Isle of Rome, a rare mineral that comes up from an island off the west coast of Scotland. And also a beaker, which was found in one of the terminal ends of the ditch and it's squashed flat. Um, this obviously brings up some interesting thoughts into the review, so it wasn't just a continuous use of these hedges. But we do have ones that were built in the Bronze Age, and this is Millfield North. Uh, this is the best excavated example from the Millfield Basin. Uh, it was dated to the Bronze Age, along with a, there was a possible bit of cup and ring rock art found in a pit, which was a sealed layer dated to the Bronze Age, which is one of the, one of the ways that we can date with rock art, which is notoriously hard to, to figure out where it came from. But also in the top of this, talking about reuse, also, on the top of this hedge, there was also a number of Saxons buried. So there's a quite a, there's a definite use throughout the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, and then it seems that the, apart from one one place called Flodden Camp has Iron Age reuse in it, but then it seems that there's a lot of Anglo-Saxon activity that starts to happen in these sites thousands of years later. And they were very interested in it, and this is landing to what. I thought I'd have this because it nearly killed me trying to find this thing. Or I was lost in the woods second time for a lost nest. 
<laughs> third time's the charm, though, and I found it. And here we can see, very rightly, there's two cups there with rings around them. But next to them, three Saxon rings. Um, it is believed that they say Lathan, or uh, where we get the word leave or relic. But uh, if, uh, if anyone here uh, reads Saxon rooms, I'd love to know what your thoughts is on that. And then we've got this one, it's from Routing Language. And the hills around these areas are absolutely strewn with the uh, cup and ring uh, carvings uh, of the Bronze Age. And that's that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>